Hi, everybody. Welcome to the next session at the Purpose Driven Business Summit. We're really glad that you've uh, decided to join us either live or watching the recording later. We're going to be hearing uh, today from Carrie Gill with Savannah Sandals. And so I think you're going to really enjoy hearing where her motivation came from and what she's been doing to get things going with her company and how things are working. She's going to have some great things to share. So before we um, start our conversation, I want to just remind you of a few logistics like I do at the beginning of every session. Um, all these recordings, all these sessions are recorded. And as a attendee of the summit, you're going to have access to all of them. I just want to make sure you know that the link I've sent out to YouTube, you have to use that link to get to the recordings. Um, if you just go search for it without using the link, they show up as unlisted, so you can't access them. So I'll continue to send out the YouTube link, but you may want to bookmark that. So if you want to go back and listen to somebody that you didn't listen to or re-listen to something, you actually can get access to that. The other thing I just want to remind you about is we have a private Facebook group and that's meant to be a place where you can share ahas or what you're up to, ask questions. You know, that's the equivalent in the days of Zoom of like the networking piece of actually going to a conference. So um, it's been a little quiet in there. So I encourage you to take advantage, get to know each other. Um, and get some dialogue going because you know those of us that are interested in purpose-driven business we tend to be pretty passionate and have a lot of curiosity about what people are doing so that's one way that you can have some dialogue with other folks from actually around the world we have people from i think it's nine countries so far that have registered and are participating in the summit which is just great i think that speaks to the swell of interest that is happening about purpose-driven companies. So those are my reminders. And now let's get into the good stuff. So Carrie, welcome to the Purpose Driven Business Summit. Thanks a ton for making time to um, talk with us and share what you've been up to. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be a part of the summit. Um, so as soon as I saw some of the other uh, speakers, I felt really honored. I mean, it's uh, a lot of great ideas and businesses that are participating. So very excited. Great. Well, why don't we start with you sharing a little bit about your background and how did, how did you end up starting Savannah Sandals? Um, yeah, so I actually was, uh, it was my last semester in college at Colorado University in Boulder. And um, while I was in college, I was in the Air National Guard. So mm -hmm. kind of a weekend warrior thing, but I went on a deployment to Africa uh, in 2012 to 2013. And uh, kind of the catalyst was Africa, but really this class at, um, at in college where we had to, it was the capstone course, we had to come up with a uh, innovative idea to work on throughout the remainder of the semester. So forming a team, developing a business plan, eventually pitching for funding. Uh, really just wanted to spend this time wisely working on something that I actually believed in. Mm -hmm. um, so I spent a long time brainstorming, researching, going through old notes of ideas that I had scribbled down over the years, walking around Pearl Street in Boulder just to kind of get ideas sparked and um, thinking about the world in general, so kind of some abstract thinking, but I knew it had to be, in order to be successful, that it, you know, it had to be innovative, mm -hmm. and then it had to solve a real problem that either businesses or consumers were having, um, whether they knew they were having that problem or not, mm -hmm. but I also, for me, it needed to be something that I was passionate about, and I had heard that time and again from successful entrepreneurs that if you're not passionate about it, then, you know, when the going gets tough and things don't work out the way that you thought they would, it'll be a lot more difficult to overcome because you didn't, you didn't have your heart in it in the first place, like mm -hmm. you needed to. So, um, yeah, that was a, a big prerequisite. 
And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but that meant that it had to be purpose-driven. Um, didn't know that was a thing even, but um, that was kind of where it all started. And, and the Air National Guard, I didn't foresee a business idea coming from my time in the military, um, but that deployment to Africa was kind of where it all started, um, had a huge impact on me. So perspectives on life, in other cultures, my worldview, everything changed. Um, and I knew, you know, if I could think of something related to that experience, I'd be so driven for it to succeed. Mm -hmm. It would feel less like work and more like my passion project, which is ultimately what it became. Um, and so a couple of things specifically that really stuck with me were pollution uh, and then my time at the orphanage. The pollution in um, Djibouti is where, was where we were. Mm -hmm. It was mostly plastic and, and uh, just trashed, kind of washing up on the shores, a lot of plastic bags. Uh, they had a burn pit to manage everything, but I mean, unfortunately, every time they would burn the garbage, it would just fill the air with smoke. So a lot of toxic carcinogens, things that you just, you couldn't fathom here um, that really shook the way that I perceived how others lived mm -hmm. um, and wanted to, to do something about it. But I also felt if everyone else could see this, they would want to do something to help um, just like I did. Because honestly, I never considered myself to be like an environmentalist of any kind. I uh, was always like more interested in uh, like nutrition and holistic health. But um, the more that I thought about what I saw, the more I researched to understand it, and the more I realized that the problem is big, really harmful, but most importantly, it's preventable. So if more people knew and felt compelled by something larger than themselves to do things a bit differently, um, then we'd be able to make a difference. So Savannah Sandals kind of came out of that. Well, I, that's great. So it sounds like that, that work experience in Djibouti like really had a huge impact on you. Um, I know when I went to Haiti, um, to do some work after college. It's like, wow, like it changed me forever as well. So, you know, some of those things, you just never even know how it's going to play out later. So Savannah was sort of born from that, plus your, um, the course that you were doing at CU Boulder. So how did you come up with sandals and how they're constructed? So tell us a little about that. Yeah, I couldn't decide between the two, the two topics, the pollution and the uh, kids at the orphanage who everyone was wearing flip-flops. Um, and so some of the kids had one flip-flop. It's like the biggest thing that, um, that I talk about when, when I discuss like why flip-flops. Um, but I just couldn't, I, I knew it, I, I wanted to do something about the pollution, but then also there were the kids. And so I just kind of combined the two. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and it just kind of worked out in that way. But then I had no idea, of course, how to actually make that a reality. Um, I just, you know, this at this point, it was a business plan. Um, it was an idea that I had a lot of uh, hopes and dreams for, but there's no, you know, there's no guide out there, or book that you can pull off the shelf to say like, all right, here's how to do the specific thing that you just uh, came up with. And, and I guess, you know, when you're thinking of something innovative, that's always going to be the case. Uh, and so just pulling from what information was available, um, dusty books at the library. I felt like such a nerd coming back with all of these books on rubber and recycling methods. And, um, and I loved it, like every minute of it. So it wasn't, you know, when it's, when it's something that you truly care about, um, because you know that you're going to be able to help other people, or uh, in this case, you know, I was, we were going to raise awareness around um, sustainability and recycling efforts and something that's so, it sounds so mundane and just uninteresting. And for me, prior to this, it was like, yeah, I'll recycle, you know, if it's available to me. And I just, there wasn't anything past that. And so the methods that I kind of came up with, it was really just like a gut feeling. Um, I started reaching out to manufacturers and most of them didn't really, I mean, they weren't communicative. A lot of them um, 
didn't speak English. Um, I had heard be very careful about manufacturing in China um, mm -hmm. and I didn't have any contacts. So I was pretty um, apprehensive to move forward in, in that direction. And also it was so important to remain ethical and to make sure that our manufacturer had um, ethical practices. So like paid their workers fair wages, had good working conditions. Um, this was part of the overall, I, I guess, purpose driven or purpose meaning behind what Savannah's was doing. So um, everyone that, that we were gonna work with had to, um, had to also kind of believe in the same values. Um, so I found a manufacturer in South Africa, uh, luckily, um, so close to kind of where we were, were hoping to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, would really like to, to kind of do an inno innovative project with you um, and make some sandals out of recycled tires. And they said, no, it, it can't be done. Um, we've tried it, it doesn't work there not the type of quality that we would even consider producing for our customers, which by the way, is when I decided, okay, now I have to work with you um, <laughs> based on that response. Yeah. But um, I said, okay, well, I've been doing a lot of research and I think that you can take recycled tire crumb. Um, and there was a facility just a couple of miles away from you. Here's their contact information. And um, you can use that in a similar way too. And I just kind of started filling in these gaps for them. And they were like, um, okay, like didn't respond for a while. Finally came back, um, I think it was like a month later and said, okay, we're, we'll try it. Um, and then that, that was it. It was like, I kind of sent over this information, hoping that maybe what, with what they knew about making flip-flops and with what I felt just totally in my gut, like this might work. Uh, you might be able to do this. Um, and they, and they kind of <laughs> just, just agreed. And so that was a really big moment. Mm -hmm. And I think spoke a lot to the fact that um, like having a purpose behind what you're doing makes things that seem impossible possible. Um, when otherwise you might just say, oh, it, it just can't be done. Right. Well, I think that's, you know, because you're not coming out of a recycling rubber back, you know, background or right. <laughs> or basically training up the manufacturer on what's possible. Um, so tell us what the process actually is. So there's this. So there's a tire. Then what happens? Yeah. So there are a lot of um, tire recycling facilities just globally. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they take a, a tire and sh basically shred it up into different levels of granules. So um, based on the granule size is kind of determines what you can use it for or repurpose it to do. Okay. And um, a, a really good comparison would be like track and field. So any of the tracks around schools are typically made from um, pulverized tires that have been repurposed and um, kind of have that like grainy feel. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, at, at, at that stage, that's um, kind of an, an outsourced thing. And so then the manufacturer purchased uh, a couple different sizes of granules and just tested to see which ones were going to work the best. Um, and then which so, kind of solution. So they had to have um, different adhesives. There wasn't you know, there was no, um, like, well, this is going to work the best. They had to try a lot of different things and, um, and then also wear test. So put them on your feet, wear them for as long as you can to see how quickly or slowly, ideally, they were going to break down <laughs> based yeah. on the products you used. Wow. That's a, that's one heck of a process. Um, so good for you. Like that you push them to be willing to figure out how to make it work. And they were open to it in the end. Sounds like they had to do some dialogue on their side to decide to jump into the deep end of the swimming pool with you. Absolutely. I, yeah, they, because I didn't have any funding at that point. So they baked the R&D costs into um, like when they actually had the sandal produced. So it made the cost of goods sold higher 
um, in, in the end, but otherwise, I mean, I, I didn't have funding for R and D. Um, but they were, you know, when I found this manufacturer, they were a zero waste factory. So I knew that they, you know, they kind of had the same um, values already at that point. And I thought like, okay, this, this might, but yeah, I got really lucky and, and for them to just agree on and go on a whim like that. Um, well, but they, obviously they saw some possibility in it. And I think one of the things that's really interesting based on what you just shared for other people that are thinking about starting something that they don't actually know how it fully works is you, you do your research like you did, um, but then there's different options of how to actually get it started. It's not always that you have to have a lot of money in the bank. Um, if you can find a manufacturer that's willing to kind of work with you and come up with a creative way to make it happen. Like that's a, that's a really cool example of how that's really possible. Right. Yeah. It was definitely not the cheapest option. Um, but you know, that's just part of the, part of the, the, the startup and, having a little bit more to, to stick to in, in terms of, um, you know, what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. Yeah. Um, so if you're looking more for like purpose over profit, mm -hmm. it doesn't even, you know, obviously you have to have like a business mind and in, in, in place and make certain decisions that aren't going to just drive everything into the ground, but you do make a sacrifice in a lot of ways um, to keep that purpose throughout the course of the, the startup phase and operating. Um, and yeah, in this case, it worked out. Yeah, absolutely. So how long was the process from when you first decided you thought this was a cool idea until you actually had a product that you felt met your quality standards that you could start thinking about getting to market with like what was what was the length of time it took you to do that the initial idea was in 2013 so that was um my senior capstone course yeah and that was called it was kusaga sandals is what our group came up with which was recycle in swahili um after that uh, three years went by so i thought about it a lot Mm -hmm. Um, the moment that I came up with the idea and presented it to the class, I was like, I'm going to do this. Um, but there's, you know, there are so many things that come up when you're coming up with something that's innovative. You're like, but how, um, and when the answers aren't readily available, it's easy to just say, okay, like I'll just wait until the right time next week. <laughs> yeah. Or just whatever the things well I, when i find someone who is wants to invest or when i find a co-founder or um i mean a lot of things that come into play when you're taking a big leap of faith um mm -hmm. that is going to you're, you're going to invest a lot of time and inevitably money um to get it started so um it's a roundabout answer here but uh it was three years before after that class before i finally pulled the trigger um, because I, I just kept thinking about it and I kept, mm -hmm. it's like, it's something that you, that you actually care that much about and it's never going to go away. And I thought, well, what, what am I going to be like having a midlife crisis later and thinking I should have done that idea or <laughs> what, what, what regrets am I going to have? And so I actually, I saw this quote, it said, um, you'll never catch a fish if you're not standing in the sea. So just start somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so I just did. I was like, okay, LLC, here we go. And then everything followed. Um, lots of just not hearing back from people. And, and again, you know, finding the right manufacturer. Um, but R&D with them was about a year from the time that they said, okay, we'll do it till I got the first shipment of sandals. Um, that to me at the time, because I was so eager and excited, that felt like a long time. And looking back, I think probably could have used another year. Um, but I had already launched the website and kind of got the hype going and had a lot of pre-orders. And so that pressure then to deliver before summer um, 
was something that I had injected unknowingly into the process that, um, you know, prevented us from pushing out the, um, the R and D a little bit further. So yeah, when I actually got the first shipment of sandals, um, I had never seen them before. I just, the manufacturer sent me photos and I was like, yep, they look good. Um, <laughs> put them on my feet and I was like, all right, these aren't going to be for everyone, but we've had good feedback so far. That's great. So if you had extended the R&D phase longer, what else would you have wanted to do that you didn't do? Like with hindsight and basically as guidance for other people that you know, are thinking about doing a product production um, type of a business. Yes. Um, I learned a lot from the pre-orders what colors were actually popular. Mm -hmm. um, and so taking that information and applying it to the actual order would have been a game changer because now I have a lot of canary sandals and people really, really like black, um, which again, in hindsight, like I'm not, I'm so like not a, a, a rubber specialist, not a, a fashion or retail specialist. Um, so just kind of taking everything from like research, talking to people and, and then any data that I've come across along the way has been at this point, like, okay, that, that makes sense. It would have been nice to have analyzed that and had that prior to putting the order in. So like pre-orders um, would have identified which colors to order more of or, or less of. Um, the sandals themselves, if I had if they had sent me a pair and I had tried them on and, and walked around for a little while, I would have said, you know what, for me, these are a little too heavy. Um, a lot of people like that, but that's, it's all personal preference. Um, so I probably would have said like, can we, let's come up with a way, let's use a little bit less tire crumb and a little more um, like virgin uh, rubber and see how that, how that works out. Um, so there are a, a, a couple of things that we could have tweaked. Um, they, I knew that the manufacturer wasn't going to send anything that they didn't feel were, were high quality, luckily. Uh, and so, you know, and they didn't, but uh, definitely having the product in hand and being able to make those adjustments, mm -hmm. um, which seems obvious, but, but again, like when you have that pressure from the pre-orders and, um, and the hype that you don't want to lose before, you know, if we had extended another year, who knows, we would have had to like do the whole announcement process all over again and, um, and lose that momentum. Um, yeah. I can't even imagine how tough it is to, you know, you're doing an innovative product and then you have to make an order of sizes and colors and, wow, you know, it's like <laughs> tough. I would think it's tough to, especially early on, like figuring out, okay, so what is the usual size that somebody might want? And, you know, you don't want to end up with a bunch of like little teeny weeny ones or two big ones or yeah, like how to balance. Yeah. I'm sure that's been a learning process. Absolutely. Because I went for off of the manufacturer's recommendation. Of course I did my own research, but I mean, there's no Google answer or Quora answer for that. Um, so the, the manufacturer's recommendation um, was specific to, I guess people in South Africa and Europe have smaller feet than Americans. <laughs> so I have like, no, yeah. like you said, very teeny weeny, lots of teeny weeny sandals. For us, great, because we can donate them to the orphanages. Um, but like, totally running out of stock on extra larges. And I like what we were talking about earlier because of COVID, we can't even import anything from South Africa right now to get a, a restock. So it's like, <laughs> it is definitely always the learning curve. Absolutely. So when stuff ships out of South Africa, what does it have to do to get here? Um, like goes on a boat? Yeah. Like, I don't know. Ours went on a boat. They did a uh, freight um, shipping on a, it was on a boat. Yeah. 
No, it's not a big pallet. So is it they're not shipping or the U.S. isn't accepting things in? The U.S. isn't accepting things in, like mail in general or any shipments. So, Well, that puts a monkey wrench in things. Yes. <laughs> Summer season when people want flip-flops. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, I think we're okay. Like we're past the, uh, for retail, um, summer season, th all of the orders come in before 4th of July. So oh. that's their biggest week, um, in the summer. And so we are maybe going to be okay for this season. Um, <laughs> fingers crossed. Right. Right. But then there's places throughout the U S that, you know, they need more summer stuff like, year round. Um, so, yeah. So if it were any other year, I mean, absolutely. Because, um, holiday weekends, um, resorts. So like in the winter, anything down South, but I mean, no one knows what's, what's going to happen right now. I mean, with travel and this whole, yeah, dare I say the global pandemic. Yeah. Like, talk about it but you know people aren't taking vacations like they would normally so right. um yeah it's definitely throwing a wrench in but but it's you know the domino effect in in every case so it's we can't get our sandals but also maybe we don't need the sandals because people aren't traveling or you know whatever the case is so it's it's affecting everything so what have you found to be the most successful sales channels for your sandals? Um, I know you've got a beautiful website. Like, is that the best? Is that where you sell most of your um, sandals or like how else are you doing it? Um, the website, the organic traffic from the website is, is driven from the content. So like the SEO um, and people mostly just Googling looking for um, sustainable sandals or flip-flops that they come to our site and they think they're cool then. Um, the, the, the sales that we've had the greatest success with have been through wholesale. Um, so we've met a lot of really awesome retailers and this is, this is all recent because um, based on the cost of production and manufacturing and the R&D costs, it didn't to me, it just didn't, it didn't make sense um, from a business perspective to go the wholesale route. It wasn't the most profitable way. Um, but then it kind of got to a point, because this has been a few years now, where it just made more sense to get our brand out there, to get noticed, to get on to people's feet, um, <laughs> you know, instead of um, waiting for them to come to us because of that organic growth. Um, so, so just launched on wholesale this summer and, um, yeah, now we're in five retail locations as of, I mean, it was about four weeks before we, we were in five and they're all really awesome. I mean, just, it, there's a lot of growth has happened in the space of, um, like purpose-driven retail and, um, social good and, and conscious consumerism, um, just in the last five years, really. Um, so really, really fortunate to have partnered up with some awesome retailers just throughout the U.S., one in Canada, actually. That's very cool. So you find that um, the folks that are most interested are people that want to make sure that the products they're selling in their store are sustainable, consciously made, you know, companies with the right values. And so you're a great example of that then. So. Right. And flip-flops are in, you know, <laughs> you want, you, you want flip-flops and you know, you're doing good at the same time, like even better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's easy, right? Like flip-flops are not, you know, you're not investing in a ton of pairs of flip-flops um, to wear all the time, but it's the kind of like your, your shoes by the door. It's your little reminder before you leave, like, hey, um, like, be good to others, be good to the planet. I, I mean, if it's, even if it's just that, and I, and I heard this from my, my future mother-in-law, she said, you know, when I look down, the favorite, my favorite part about the sandals is it says Savannah Sandals on the, um, on the sole. And she's like, 
I just love that. I just love seeing that. I love the reminder. And that was huge to me to see that someone else was actually gaining a bit of insight or passion or whatever was getting passed on to the consumer from the product that was ideated and created with that in mind. Mm -hmm. um, so to see that that actually was playing out on uh, you know, the people who were purchasing them was, was the goal and so huge to, to have that validated. Absolutely. I, I'm sure those kind of moments are like, yes, all the, the struggle has been worth it. Um, like, yes, we're getting rid of some of these tires and you're able to give back. So I want to talk about that. Um, and you're getting people to, you know, giving them subtle reminders that, okay, there's some other things to think about other than, you know, what are you going to have for lunch? Um, <laughs> so, right. So talk about um, the cause piece of what you do. You've mentioned um, donating sandals to children. So tell us more about what all of that looks like and how you pick who you choose to partner with. Yes. So, um, Partnering with, and we talked about the manufacturer, but the um, charity that we uh, donate to was actually kind of difficult to find um, in terms of like response rate from nonprofits in general. Um, you, you know, before diving into it, I thought, oh, well, we're, we're reaching out to these um, nonprofits and these charities and we, we want to donate and we wanna set up a recurring donation um, based on our profits. So it's, it'll be pretty easy to get them to respond to us. And it just, I mean, it was difficult. Um, I don't think that, I don't know if that means that they're not used to people reaching out and wanting to have an actual relationship with them. Um, but that was really important to me to make sure that uh, we understood their operations so we could say, you know, to our customers who were purchasing the sandals in part because of this reason, because they knew they were going to be giving back, we wanted to say, this is exactly what your purchase is going towards. Um, and so we, the uh, charity that we ended up going with was, it was the only one where the founder called and said, um, you know, we set up a phone call and he was super appreciative and um, wanted to discuss the, the inquiry, but also share more information about um, how they do things. It's 98% of the donations go towards the charity directly, and then 2% for operating costs. So, I mean, that was major for us to know. And um, he, where, where are they based? So the charity is out of Texas. Um, he operates it actually from his home in Galveston. Mm -hmm. And then um, the, like, where all of the money goes and the volunteers go to help support uh, is an or or orphanage and a school in Africa um, called Star Kid. And so um, any of the donations that we give are going towards things like, uh, like when we donated initially, it, he said, we're going to use this to buy a new printer for the school, like, which was just great. Um, you can, you know, depending on the amount, it'll go, go towards um, tuition mm -hmm. for kids for the year, which they have an exact cost. It's like $7.95 a year for each um, child to go to the school. And um, yeah, the one thing that I was surprised about is that they said, uh, you know, they were super apprehensive. They said a lot of organizations reach out to them with the same the same conversation um hey we want to donate and we want to use your logo um to let our customers know that we're donating to you uh and then nothing ever comes of it so they were actually pretty gun shy um mm -hmm. we had to get approval from the board to donate to them and um send a letter of intent on you know what what we were thinking why we thought they were a good fit um, and things like that before they would actually approve it. And uh, it just kind of opened up my eyes to the fact that there are probably a lot of purpose-driven businesses out there who aren't really acting on, you know, what they 
are supposed to be, which yeah. in some cases, I mean, for me, I can understand like when it, when it becomes financially driven, for instance, like there are some times, there have been many moments where I thought really shouldn't be donating right now, should, should be putting this money back into operating costs and the next thing. And I mean, um, recovering the initial investment pretty much every time, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter because that's not why Savannah Sandals was founded. Um, that's, that's just not the purpose behind it. If, if suddenly I said, you know what, this year we can't afford to make the donation. I might as well just change the purpose of the business. Now we're not, you no, know, now our purpose is to be the most profitable. We just want to make the most money. And that's, so that'll never change. It's not something that you can just go back on. So there's a struggle there. I mean, it's a sacrifice and it's definitely a commitment. Well, and like, I think as you mentioned, you know, when times get tough, it's, it's really easy to say, mm, well, we'll give later. Um, but if it's at the core of what you've set the business up to do, like staying true to that, then you can feel really good. So I think that's a great tip for people. It's like, you know, you've got to stick to your guns, even when it's hard. Um, and it is interesting that, uh, you know, you have had issues with um, people getting back to you and even wanting to explore the possibility. Um, you know, usually like nonprofits are a little more, okay, okay, like what can we get? So that, did you have pretty specific um, requests when you were reaching out of what you needed them to be doing, like what you were looking for really? And so do you think people sort of self-selected themselves out or do you think it was just something else going on? I think, um, I really just think that they're not used to having a, any type of relationship with the people who donate. Um, because, you know, a lot of nonprofits operate more as a business, uh -huh. um, a lot of the, the bigger ones. And so, um, you know, maybe they, they don't have time to, to field that it, to them. It's like, yeah, if you want to donate, just send us money. Um, we're focusing on our cause. I, you know, I'm not totally sure what the exact reason is. Um, yeah, it, but it was, it was interesting and, um, maybe a little obsessive of, of me to think that we'd be able to get a ton of responses and, and have a, a relationship. But well, then we ended up finding someone who, you know, we were able to have that, that relationship with. So, um, you know, it was perfect for the mission. And, um, and I would say, yeah, there are probably a multitude of reasons that they don't get back to, to uh, people reaching out, but don't let that, inhibit or, or hinder you from continuing to reach out to even the same, uh, the same person, because this was over the course of uh, um, just a few months for us. We could have probably kept reaching out um, and, and maybe gotten a response. Well, and another thing I'm sort of hearing in what you're saying is you need to be clear on what kind of an organization you're looking to partner with and what kind of activities they're doing that you can feel good about supporting. Uh, and, you know, I have done a lot of training on business nonprofit partnerships, and I think a lot of, especially a bit smaller nonprofits, you know, they want the biggest company um, in town to, they want Nike to be their next, like, corporate partner. Um, and, you know, they would be way better served to um, make a develop a relationship with a smaller company that is going to really care about what they're doing and be consistent like you are in terms of how you engage with them. So, you know, for people listening, um, if you're with a nonprofit, you know, have conversations. If you get approached, that's like a, have a conversation with the business and see, you know, is there some affinity and a way to work together that's win-win. Um, and, don't hesitate to have those conversations. It's not just about getting the check in the mail from some unknown face. Uh, so I applaud you that you, you, you know, you kind of felt like you were putting things out there into the black hole and you weren't getting much response, but 
it's such a key piece of what you're up to that you stuck with it. So, and now you have a relationship with this organization and you were able to tell us, okay, seven ninety five to sponsor a kid to go, you know, <laughs> right. When you know, then you actually really know what your resources are doing and how they're being used. So that's very important. And sometimes businesses don't ask enough questions either um, about, it sounds like the, the guy that you were um, developing the relationship with was very forthcoming with information about how they operate. Um, so that helped with your selection process. But, you know, a lot of, we do good, so just support us, you know, and then it's harder to figure out, well, how, how are my resources really helping? Um, so sometimes you have to ask those questions if they're not forthcoming. Right. So, that you know it's 2% basically for admin costs. Like, you know, you know a lot about how they operate and how your resources are being used. So I think that's a best practice actually to, you know, pick a, a bit smaller organization. It's not like it's care or save the children one of the very big dogs. Um, not that working with them would be a bad thing in any way, but you know, you've got an organization I'm sure that really appreciates what you're doing for them. And you right. know, you can be more involved as well. So kudos. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so what do you see as some of the biggest impacts you've been able to have so far? And what do you want for the future? Uh, yeah. I'd say a pretty significant impact right off the get-go was when our manufacturer um, agreed to try to develop the sandals mm -hmm. um, because now they actually have a, a line of, of innovative sandals. And so they're supplying um, a, a different version, but sandals made from recycled tires to other uh, clients of theirs, which is just contributing to one of our goals of raising awareness mm -hmm. um, and kind of putting it out there that having sandals made from recycled materials isn't so much of a faux pas as maybe it used to be. There's a way to do that that is going to be um, well received by consumers. Um, so that's a big impact because, you know, Having it now, now they just have a, a full range of, of these sandals that we helped them to develop. Um, so getting tires off, you know, they're not going to landfills, they're not getting burned, you know, you're starting to, you and other companies that are following your lead are all, like it's a big world, there's lots of tires. So, um, right you know, kind of getting a movement going on that, that's a, that's a huge impact that you've had, it sounds like. Right, it's sparking the conversation. I mean, a client could come to them now and say, why are you, why recycle tires? And then they can, you know, have that back and forth. And it's, again, it's just, it's just spreading mm -hmm. um, that awareness. Yeah, that's great. So, You've given some tips as we've been talking about things for people to think about. Do you have other like lessons learned or, or guidance that for folks that are either thinking about starting a purpose-driven business or who maybe already have and are kind of trying to figure out their next steps? Like what kinds of things can you share as food for thought for people? Sure. So, um, you know, I, ideally if you can form your purpose and your business idea at the same time in unison, um, that's, that's going to be the, the best case scenario um, because all of your decision making and everything that you do rests on the foundation of that purpose and the why behind what you're doing. Um, you know, they say people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And that's, that's your purpose. Um, and if you stick to that, then the profits will follow. It shouldn't be the sales and the marketing that um, are the, the big powerhouses in your purpose. It's really like a company thing and just um, a, a, something that you stick to um, that again is the foundation of, of all of your, um, all of the things that you do from there on out. Um, I'd say also just don't settle 
um, for something. Uh, if you know that you want to start a, a purpose-driven business, then you'll know when you have the right idea. It'll be so obvious to you that you won't be able to ignore it. Um, I mean, Samantha Sandals, that idea, this was back in 2013 when I initially thought of it. And this is when, you know, companies like SendGrid uh, were just getting their legs under them. Digital Ocean had just left Techstars. Tech was something that, if you were going to start a startup, it, it just, oh, you're not starting a tech startup. I mean, it was abnormal. Um, and I had that in the back of my mind thinking like, ah, I just, you know, I should really do tech because um, that's going to draw the most uh, attention and um, investors will be most interested in that. So we'll be able to get funding and it'll probably be more profitable more quickly. And all of these things that you think about when you're starting a business but there was never anything deeper than that. There wasn't going to be anything providing uh, any more meaning than just like a, a functional benefit to the customer. Uh, it wasn't providing any more meaning really to me other than that I knew that I had an entrepreneurial spirit and wanted to start a business. So just don't settle. Um, like keep thinking, keep thinking about why you're doing what you're doing and then use that to project um, to, to everyone else. And the excitement and, and the passion will inevitably just be a part of that. And then you'll be set moving forward, I, I, I really believe. Well, I think that's good guidance. Because um, if you're not clear why you're doing it fully at the beginning, it's easy to make some decisions that in the long term won't serve um, what the bigger purpose was. So, and like you said, you know, you to stay the course, not always easy, um, but you were clear what you wanted to be known for in the end, and you really wanted to walk your talk. I hear that loud and clear. So um, any other guidance for folks about things you learned that you wish you'd known uh, when you first were starting this? Things that I'd know, um, let's see. I think, um, Having a, a team right off the bat is probably pretty uh, useful. And, um, you know, of course, you can certainly bring people in down the line, but um, there's a lot, there's so much that goes into it uh, that, you know, when you're, you're talking about a passion project or, or starting something that you um, have been thinking about for a while, it can feel like maybe you won't be able to find someone who cares about it as much as you do. And um, I'd just say, just throw that out the window because if you look hard enough and talk to enough people, um, you, you will. And I'm not saying that you need a co-founder or um, someone in the early stages, but I think it's, I think it's beneficial to help carry the um, responsibilities and it will, um, it'll move everything forward a lot more efficiently because I've been, working on Savannah Sandals um, as a side project. Mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of instances where I felt that it, we, we could have been further along um, or more successful sooner or, um, you know, what woulda, coulda, shoulda if, uh, if I had more time or more people mm -hmm. um, and of course more uh, income or, or investment um, or funding. But, um, yeah, so I think I think definitely finding someone else that um, is passionate about it, and with a purpose-driven business, that's typically pretty easy um, when you start talking about why you're doing what you're doing, because um, you can find other people who have that that same value and um, want to share it, want to be a part of it, and uh, and then you know you'll have that again that foundation. Yeah, that's I think that's great guidance, and. You know, just even being out talking with people that may generate ideas. Like in your case, you had like the download of, okay, this is what I want to do. Um, and then it, it like, it wouldn't go away. So like, that's a clear sign that, okay, right. about this, you know, I keep waiting for something to come down about a product that I could sell. And I, you know, I'm like, all right, I'm ready. Like <laughs> on. And you know, my brain doesn't work like that. And I, I've been more of a, uh, a consultant trainer. So like, that's the zone I'm comfortable in. But like, I really um, am in some ways envious of somebody like yourself that has such a clear idea 
of a product and what you want it to stand for. And you've like stuck by your, your grounds and really made it happen. So kudos to you. Thank you. <laughs> but you know, your consulting background and the contribution that you make towards other businesses, that's something that a lot of people don't think about right? Like some, someone who is um, very driven towards other things, um, and then maybe it's a product, isn't thinking about the why as a, they're thinking about, um, maybe they're more analytical, they have spreadsheets running in their mind all the time. And they're like, well, I, this is just going to be, uh, this is going to be a great bottom line, and I'm going to do it. And here's how it's going to go. And, and they're not thinking about like, con connecting with their customer and, um, yeah. So, I mean, it really just speaks to all of the different facets and how everyone has their strong uh, strengths and weaknesses. And, and it's, it's definitely nothing that can be done in a vacuum ever, especially when you're talking about your purpose. Yeah. Well, okay. That makes me feel a little better. So, <laughs> <laughs> so as we're wrapping down any like last words to the wise that you'd like to share with people, I think it's been really interesting to hear what your path was and how courageous you were really to kind of blaze new trails. So that's been really useful, but any like last little tidbits you'd like to share? Um, you know, I think I covered everything that I, that I was really wanting to, to go over. Um, I mean, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to, to field those. If there's any anything else. Um, any questions, we have the chat feature. You should be able to see it at the bottom of your screen. So um, I see Yudi had said, yay, finally able to attend live. I've been watching replays, so excited. So <laughs> to you that you're able to be here. If anybody has any questions, please um, type them in. And don't be shy. I know Carrie would be glad to um, answer some. Well, yeah, and it can be some doesn't matter the size, right? We were we were talking about how, you know, sometimes you you don't want to ask a question that you think maybe no one else cares about, but hey, here we go. Okay, any plans for recycling used sandals? That's a good question. So, uh, I have thought about that because um, it with this the the way that this business operates you, you really have to think about full cycle, and especially when it comes to sustainability and, and trying to be zero waste. So what happens to these sandals made from recycled product when the customer is done wearing them or um, when they wear out or whatever um, happens to them? And we don't want them, obviously, then to just go straight to the landfill where we were saving the tire from. Um, and so, yeah, the, the plans for that have they've always been top of mind. Um, do, and, and one of the things we've thought about is um, the, the bags that we send to uh, consumers that we ship our sandals in are reusable. So they have two straps, so they're compostable and reusable. Um, the customer can always send us their sandals um, down the road whenever they're done with them. And then we uh, would credit, you know, or discount um, towards a new pair of sandals. So that's been, and then we would, we would then um, recycle or uh, dispose of the used pair properly. Mm -hmm. That's something that we're considering. Um, Project, huh? Yeah, yeah. And it all just, you know, it's, it's very much based on um, trying to do everything. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you're still looking at like, well, how can we do this um, that, is, that is going to be uh, responsible in terms of financials? But um, yeah, that's a great question. Well, and you know, I think what I'm hearing you say is like, you can have ideas for some of the, the great things that are possible also to do, but it's still a stepwise kind of a thing. And, you know, when you get to that point, you're, you're already playing around with some ideas of how to do that, but the timing isn't quite right is sort of what I'm hearing you say. Right. Yeah. It has to be, you have to be definitely um, well thought out 
and um, I wouldn't say it's that far out, um, but luckily we're not at a point where anyone, any of our customers' sandals should have worn out by now. So <laughs> that's a good. We have a little bit of time. <laughs> that's also good. And you also don't until you have figured out the whole thing of what to do with them once people mail them back, like. You don't want a pile of sandals in your living room, so. <laughs> right, right, because, yeah, exactly, because storing inventory is costly in itself, so. Right, absolutely. Any other questions? I'm taking a look over at chat. Any comments? We'll give it another couple of seconds. Um, I just think it's really great that you know, the synchronicity in a way. You were doing a course at CU that you had to develop a business plan and you wanted to do something that was not just a paper exercise. And that happened to co coincide with when you're in Djibouti and had, you know, this eye-opening experience and you were able to combine those things together and really make it happen. So I really appreciate you sharing your story with us. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. You know, I love talking about Savannah Sandals, so <laughs> anytime. Yeah, great. Well, and thank you everybody that tuned in live to um, listen to Carrie tell her story of Savannah Sandals. And I hope those of you that are listening to the recording later also um, get some great tips and get inspired by what Carrie has been able to do and the stick to that it takes to really do your passion project and make it into a profitable business that does good. Um, I think what you're hearing, it doesn't happen overnight, but you got to stick with it. And then, wow, it's exciting to hear where you're, where you're going. So congratulations, Carrie. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs>